Praise God. Good morning. Turn, if you will, to Romans chapter 13 as kind of a starting point this morning. Interesting, last week was one of those days when I woke up Sunday morning not knowing what the service was going to be about. And this, this time I've had you know, thoughts going around my head for several days, so kind of up to the Lord how he wants to do things. But that's all right, as long as he does it. But, um, you know, we're, we're coming into a passage here where Paul has been giving us the therefore that follows the reality of the gospel and what God has done for us. And, you know, and back in 12, he talks about giving ourselves to the Lord and being changed, being not conformed and made like this world. And then he begins to kind of elaborate on specifics as to the kind of people that God wants us to be uh, with relationship to each other, with relationships to people outside, with relationships to governments and authorities and taxes. And he, he covers the gamut of stuff, uh, the kind of people that he wants his people to be in the world. But anyway, and uh, verse 11 is kind of where I want to jump off because he says to do all these things. It says, and do this understanding the present time. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over, the day is almost here, so let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. And so Paul's, I guess the central theme in this is wake up and recognize the time, understand the time that they were living in. Now what's interesting is we are inclined to think of this in terms of the end of the age, but here was Paul 2,000 years ago saying the same thing. So in one sense, this is always true. It's always been true. We live in a world that hates God. Every inclination of man's nature is against God from the time that he's born. Uh, you know, we read that in several places. We, we see it following the flood, the great judgment of God upon the world of the wickedness of that day. But it wasn't long before it was very obvious what the, the nature of man and the results that were going to be in the world. And so we as God's people, those who truly know him, are called to live in a godless world. And it's a world that is forever pressing in upon our spirits. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Particularly lately, it just seems like it's more and more the case that we have to stand up for the Lord and keep a, a, uh, a spirit that's free, a spirit that's uh, you know, free to worship God and have a relationship with Him and with each other, but do it in a context that is absolutely, utterly opposed to that. Everything in the world pulls at us. And, uh, you know, we shouldn't be the least bit surprised about the conditions is exactly what the Lord has warned about, isn't it? Not only do we know that the general condition of this world is one of darkness, but that the Lord is going to, as time goes along, He is going to be uh, moving the world, I mean, allowing man to do what He wants to do. There's going to be a climax of evil. There is going to be a, a time when the world will be completely taken over, the world system, by Satan. And everybody who doesn't know the Lord is going to be absolutely clearly sealed in darkness. I mean, that's a, that's a scary proposition. And it's awfully easy for us to rock along in our lives and, and lose kind of the focus of what's going on in the world. What, what, are, we, what are we here for? Where are we going? What, what is the Lord looking for from us? And uh, it's evident from numerous places in the scriptures that one of the dangers is that God's people will... You know, we'll, we'll experience slumber and sleep and, and kind of a carelessness and a drifting. And it's something we really need to take seriously. And, uh, you know, I, I've, had to, I've had to look at my own heart and, and some things and just say, wait a minute, what's going on here? I'm just sort of, you know, I'm, I'm rocking along, I'm giving in to what I want and this and that and the other. And it's the, the, the sense of the immediacy of what the Lord is doing is not there like it, you know, like it has been at, at other times. And this is, a, this is a danger, isn't it? Is it not? 
Anybody else feel what I'm feeling? Yeah, we are being pulled. And uh, it's, a, it's a dangerous time. And I, I, I wonder if we realize the danger. Uh, you know, Jesus warned us in Matthew 24. Just let's look at two or three scriptures that, uh, that kind of confirm what I'm talking about. Particularly with respect to the end of the age. It's not just that things are going to, you know, rock along and all of a sudden Jesus is going to show up. There's going to be a true climax of history. And uh, Jesus warned his disciples who had asked about the end of the age. Some of what Jesus said, I believe, applied to the end of the Jewish age when, the, when Jerusalem was destroyed. But it certainly applies to the end in verse 9, for example. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. It's a little hard for us to... Re to uh, kind of wrap our minds around in the United States, but that's the way, that's true in much of the world today. Do you think we're going to be exempt from having to possibly lay down our lives for the Lord and take it that seriously? This is not kind of a, a fun little religious game that people play. I mean, there's so many places in, in, uh, in the world right now, in America particularly, where it's, it's really, all, it's an atmosphere of, of kind of religious entertainment that keeps the people's interest. God, we need to have something that comes from the heart. We need to have something that is real, that's built on the, on the presence of Christ in our lives and awareness of why we're here and what's going on. So anyway, it says, At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Now here's the key scripture here. It says, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. You see, there's something that just happens in the, in the very atmosphere of the world. If we don't live with an awareness of what's going on, and we just rock along and live our lives as though, well, it's, you know, God's in charge. I'm just in his hands. Everything's going to be fine. He's going to take care of everything. Man, that's a dangerous place to be. And I just sense, I sense a need. I believe the Lord senses a need in our own midst. You know, when I first came to, the church, to this church a long time ago, man, how the years do go by. Uh, you know, it was right on the heels of that tremendous visitation we experienced in the 60s when there was a tremendous spirit of revelation of, of the end of the age, the conditions that were going to come. And not only that, there was a, a presence of God that you could about cut with a knife when you come into a service. I mean, those of you who were here, you remember it. You come in, there was an electric atmosphere. And, uh, you know, we lived with a sense of, that, man, we were at the end of the age. Man, don't even go on vacation. Don't plan for the future. I mean, it was almost that, there was almost that feeling among the people. We just need to huddle together because Jesus is about to come. And it's, this is all winding up and it's all dark. And I believe the revelations themselves were true. I think I've said this a number of times. But I think we in our zeal took... Uh, you know, misunderstood some of the time scale. But let me tell you, the things that God showed us, they're happening. And if you're, if you're anywhere near my age group, or, you know, the, you lived back in the 40s, 50s, 60s, you know that this is not the same country that we were, we were brought up in. It is absolutely being transformed from what it was to Sodom. I mean, there is a spirit of wickedness that is being allowed to prevail in this land. We are, we're seeing the unfolding of what God warned us was happening. He warned us that Satan was loosed like never before, and it was very specific. This was the last loosing before the end of all things. And it wasn't just one or two little things. There was so much that was all tied in together that made it plain. That's what the Lord wanted us to understand. We have been seeing the unfolding of that ever since. And it's, if you're paying attention at all to the news, there's not a day that goes by but what there's some incredible story about some, some person who goes absolutely berserk from the world's point of view and does something totally unthinkable. And, you know, we know what it is. The Lord showed us. Showed visions of spirits entering people and they begin to act crazy. 
I mean, we, we understand. We need to understand. This is not a time to just rock along and go to sleep. This is a time that we need to be alert and awake. But there are, let me look at a couple of other scriptures that, that we're familiar with. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, I believe it is. This is specifically about the end of the age. And, you know, Paul was encouraging the people. He'd just been talking about the fact that the Lord is coming. And don't worry about those that have gone on before. We're all going to meet together in the air. We're going to be transformed. I think that comes from 1 Corinthians. But anyway... He says, he ends verse, or chapter 4 with, therefore encourage each other with these words. But now he's looking at the bigger picture and he says, now brothers, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Now the day of the Lord is an expression you find throughout the Old Testament prophets, and it's basically... This is the time when God's going to show up and judge and straighten things out. He allows wickedness to go so far, but then the day of the Lord is coming, and man, you, you know, you remember how Joel cried out, Sound an alarm, and my, blow the trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain. The day of the Lord is coming, and it's going to, I mean, there's not going to be anything left when his army goes through. It's going to be, uh, it's going to be lights out for the world. And here's the condition, while people are saying... Peace and safety, sudden or destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. I mean, that's the reality of the world we're living in and people are going along, figuring that, you know, there's nothing, nothing like that's going to happen. We're just going to go rocking along in our lives and, uh, you yeah, know, we've got to solve the problems of this world, it's true, but... You know, all that stuff, that's just passe, that's just religious dogma. I'll tell you, it, it's the truth. And it is a truth that we need to live in the light of. And that's why he follows it up with this. He says, but you brothers are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. Now, you can almost take that and say, well, we're fine then. There's no need to, to do any exhorting. That's just a simple fact. We're of the day. We're not going to be surprised and all of that. But why does he follow it up by saying this? So then, let us not be like others who are asleep. Why would he say something like that if there weren't a danger? If this were not something that we had to live with an alertness to the possibility of. But let, uh, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be alert and self-controlled. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, that is, whether we're still living at the time or we have passed on by way of death, we may live together with him, therefore encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you are doing. So on and on you get this same sense. I was just thinking about some of the things, why do we, why is that, is this danger? Why does it, this danger exist? Why is it so easy? One of the reasons certainly is the fact that there is a delay, a seeming delay. So far as we're concerned, you know, this is what happened in this church so many years ago. It was like, oh my God, five years at the outside. Jesus is coming, it's all going to be over. And of course, obviously, that wasn't what the Lord said. He wasn't trying to tell us that. But there was that sense in some, and I, I'll tell you, is it not true? There were people who were here who were basically thinking, thinking that, and I'd better be here because I'm scared. There were people whose motivation was was self-interest and, and it wasn't really a the kind of a faith that perseveres because when it didn't happen and years went on and the generations passed and 
And, uh, you know, well, I guess that wasn't real. You know, the Lord allows it to be that way to, make, to show where people's hearts really are. If you get somebody all excited about something that might happen, you can draw them in on very natural grounds. But I'll tell you, when the Lord comes, it's going to seem like the devil has won. I've, I've brought this, this point out a few times over the years, but it's something the Lord made really... I don't know, he really impressed upon me a number of years. I, I'm not going to go into all the, 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 the where's and why for's of this. Why's and wherefore's, I guess it is. But anyway, but I'm convinced there is a loosing of Satan that is pictured in Revelation chapter 20 that I believe is what is unfolding at this time. And what is it that Satan does when he is free to do whatever he wants? It talks about him going out to the nations of the world and he's gathering them together. Is not globalism one of the big isms that's, that's sort of, we're marching toward it with, you know, here and there there's a little bit of a, the brakes put on, but that is the driving spirit of our age. Tear down nations, build a world order, bring it all under one head. What, there's an inspiration behind that. It's the spirit of Satan who is trying to gather everybody on this planet under his dominion. He is going to be the king. Let me tell you something that I, I heard about the other day. I wish I could tell you all the details. But how many of you heard about the dedication of that tunnel in Switzerland recently? I don't know what the date was. They built this tremendous tunnel that's miles and miles and miles under the Alps. And they had uh, the dignitaries from across Europe there for a celebration and a ceremony opening it up. Well, that ceremony was right out of Satan's playbook. I mean, there was just the, the, the stuff that they openly portrayed. They had a goat man, which is one of the symbols of Satan, who in the, in the ceremony died, was raised from the dead, and was worshipped as the king of the world. They had people going openly, dancers and performers, simulating all kinds of ugly stuff, to, to put it simply. They had workers who were marching like drones and robots. I mean, it, it, the stuff went on and on that they were openly portraying. The, the, all the, the leaders, the dignitaries of Europe were sitting there taking all this in like this is good stuff. I mean, th this is getting bold. There's a boldness that's coming into this world. And it's more and more the, the exaltation of Lucifer. He is absolutely enthroning himself in this world. And folks, we better live with that, with that realization. And not only that, it pictures, this is symbolic language undoubtedly in Revelation 20, but it talks about him compassing about the camp of the saints. What's that about? What do you think he wants to do with anybody who names the name of Christ and still serves him? He's, he wants to destroy and obliterate any kind of opposition, anything to do with Christ. He's going to oppose it. He's going to, going to do his best to just blot it out. And there he is pictured. He's compassed about the camp of the saints. He's not talking about us being in some camp in a geographical place, but he's talking about a sense of spiritual, we're, we're surrounded. It's going to look like Satan has won. We're going to have to have the real thing. When we st anybody that stands in that day is going to have to be in a living relationship with Jesus Christ, the head of the church. He has promised to be with us to the end of the age. It's not something we need to be afraid of, but we sure need to be aware of it. And thank God for the way it turns out. I'm like Jimmy Robbins. I've read the last chapter. It turns out real good. Because right at the time when it looks like he's ready to close the deal and obliterate Christ from the earth, that's when the Lord is going to come and destroy his kingdom. Then it's going to be the judgment and everything's going to be completely set, set right. Thank God. But oh, as we come close to the, closer and closer to that time, I want to be among those who are walking in the light, who are doing what Paul said, that we're living, uh, there's an awareness. But that sense of delay, you know, is one of those, one of those deals where, you know, you, you think about where, what Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 3. Wasn't he talking about how the world would begin to mock? Where is this coming we've heard about? Since the foundation of the world, everything continues like it always has. It's, this is nonsense. And it talks about the sense that he's delaying, but the Lord says he, he's not delaying. 
He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. There's a sense of mercy. There's a sense of purpose. God is working out something that is absolutely uh, sovereign and, and is going to result in eternal glory for all those that he, that he brings in at that, in that, at that time. But there is that sense of delay that causes us to begin to sort of relax if we're not careful. You know, uh, we've often used the scriptures from Malachi. You remember how the Israelites were judged, they'd fallen into terrible sin and rebellion in spite of all the words of the prophets, and God judged them and carried them off to Babylon. And after 70 years, they began to have a restoration. And under people like Nehemiah and Ezra and Zerubbabel, the king, and, and some prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, they, they rebuilt the wall, they rebuilt the city, they rebuilt the temple, and there was a restoration of the covenant. You remember how they were gathering and, and listening to the words of the law, and the, and the word went forth, the joy of the Lord is your strength, this is a time to rejoice. There was a restoration of the covenant. And so all of the things that they had been taught to do under Moses' law, they started doing. Well, Malachi was written about a generation roughly later. And what had been a worship of God, what had been uh, something that was real and restored to them, suddenly became a, a duty. It became something that they were just kind of doing and, un and grumbling about it under their, under their breath. Why are we doing all this? This is ridiculous. Time to have a sacrifice. Okay, well, where is that scrawny runt of a lamb that we didn't want anyway? Let's carry him to the temple and offer him. And the Lord was warning them about the condition of their hearts. Now, this, the situation was this. Everybody was doing the right stuff still. If you had come in from the outside, you would have said, here's a group of, of people who love God, who are serving him. But God was able to look down in the heart and see that something had changed down in here. And you know, there is a pull that comes from our nature, that comes from the world, where a, a love for God, a, a, an awareness, living with the kind of awareness that the Lord is talking about in these scriptures, it begins to drift, it begins to become a habit, doesn't it? You know, let's talk about just gathering together. And this isn't just about, hey, why don't people come more? It, it, that's a symptom of something. As to whether people, you know, why do you come? See, that makes a difference. And it's far, it's far too easy to come because it's 10 o'clock on Sunday morning and that's what we do. Or that's what we do in our family. Or it's just, it becomes something that's just a routine, a habit. And once it begins to be like that and you think of it, I've, I've got to do that. Rather than, praise God, I want to be with God's people. I need to be in a place where I can be fed. I want to fellowship. I want something that goes on in the spirit. I'm, I'm in tune with that. That's why I want to be there. It becomes a, a duty and, and a habit. And I, I guess I jumped ahead to the word duty. God doesn't want his people to come out of some, like it's some kind of a law. He doesn't want us doing anything as part of our spiritual life like it's just a law and, a, and a, something that, by God, you better do this. Because pretty soon, once you get to that place of habit and duty, and all of a sudden, you, it's not very far before you're at the same place the folks in Malachi were. It's, it's grumbling on the inside, and then all, before you know it, it's looking for excuses. It becomes easy to find a reason to, to stay away or to not be engaged. And it's, you know, reading, our, reading the Bibles, praying, seeking God, it's a personal thing as well. It's not just gathering with, gathering with the saints when they gather. But it, it involves all of these things. God is concerned that his people not fall down, fall down this trail where all of a sudden it's, a, it's an onerous duty and a burden. I mean, literally, the people in their hearts in Malachi got to the point where they said, this is a burden. What good is it? What, what are we getting out of this? 
I mean, can't you kind of see why so many religious groups are into the place where they've got to, they've got to you know, do something in the, in the natural to entertain people and to engage them and give them an experience that makes them feel good? Folks, we're going to have a whole lot of times when uh, going forward when we're going to have to go against what our nature wants. We're going to have to have a faith that sees beyond how we're feeling and what's going on in our lives to where we are, we are so tuned into Him that we're going to stand. We're going to do something even in those times when He allows things just to rock along. The fire's not flying, but He's just as real. He's just as real in the hearts of his people, and he wants to be close to his people. I feel a need in my own heart. Do you? You feel the pull? You feel the tide that's going on in the world? Oh, I'll tell you what. You know, I'll, I'll just throw out something that's sobering in a way. But it's true. You know, we have a way of doing what we want to do. You know, you want to go here or go there or do something that's, you know, go to a ball game or go to a party or go to something. You know, oh, we can do that. Let's just get, it, get going. Church, oh, I'm tired. I got to rest. Got to get my rest. See, if you're seeing gathering here like that, then it has become a duty to you. And you're probably not even going to get something if you, if you come. God is looking for people who have real faith. And God is allowing all of this, these conditions to begin to sift through his people. Is he not? Does this not reveal conditions in hearts? I mean, some of that is just flat out unbelief. There's people that have never really come to God. And they're like some of the folks that used to come when things were so exciting. And man, they're just in there. This, oh, Christ is going to come. I better, better be here. But there was nothing really on the inside. Nothing that held them. All it took was the right conditions and they were just, they began to be gone and you just, suddenly they weren't there anymore. I thank God where there's people that, and groups where there's big, big crowds and the Lord's word is really there. But even there, I wonder how many really have what the Lord is talking about. I mean, don't we have the word that from the passage from which we get Midnight Cry Ministries? What was the condition? Yeah, they all slumbered and slept, didn't they? When was that, by the way? It was midnight. You see the symbolism going on there? You see that it's a time of, it's the, it's the peak time of darkness. It's the time when everybody, everybody's nature is just you know, you're crying out for sleep in the natural. You see, you see what's going on. There's this pull that, that makes it very, you have to put a, a real effort to stay awake at such a time. And even God's people, there's going to be a time when even God's people, there will be a slumbering and sleeping. The sobering thing was even half of those who were still professing to be wait, waiting for the coming of the bridegroom Half of them didn't know the Lord. I mean, this is a heart-searching kind of thing. This is something where we need to, be, need to realize God's not playing games. And a lot of times we can emphasize the goodness of the Lord, the mercy of the Lord, the understanding of the Lord, of, of all, you know, what we really are and how weak we are. But you can take that in a way that just almost makes him well, he's got it in his control. He's died for my sins. He's all taken care of all of that. He understands that I'm weak, so I'm just going to rock along and just, you know, I have this vague trust in him and it's going to be okay. I don't see that anywhere in here. I don't see that kind of a, a, a spirit. You notice in Malachi, there comes a point when the prophet has talked about all of the different kinds of manifestations of unbelief and just a rebellion against God that was lurking in their hearts while they were still going through the form. He says, then, at that time, there were people who spoke often one to another. And the motivation for it was they were the people who feared the Lord. 
There was a reverence. There was a respect. They didn't lose their sense of perspective of what was really going on and what was at stake. But then those who feared the Lord spoke often one to another, and the Lord heard it. And there was an angel there. He said, write that person's name down. You see how the Lord is listening and watching and knowing he knows what's going on in our lives? My God. So a lot of the problem when people go to sleep is, is simply a flat out lack of fear of the Lord. And yet we see other kinds of conditions that come in. What about the church at Ephesus? And the Lord had a message for them in Revelation chapter 2. And he enumerates all the wonderful qualities and, and the characteristics that they exhibited. They were faithful to the truth. They had even tried those who came and said, we're apostles, and then found out they were false, and they stood for the truth. They were faithful in persecution. I mean, on and on and on, these wonderful characteristics. But what was the problem? Said they had lost their first love. And that was so serious that the Lord said, unless you fix this, I'm going to come and take your candlestick away. See where the Lord's going and what he values? Sure, he values these other things, but if they aren't a fruit of that, then it becomes a practice of religion. It becomes a habit, becomes a duty very quickly. And once you start down that path, you are on a path towards just walking away from it. And it's not, a, it's not a good thing. And you also get down to where the church at uh, Laodicea. And I have all ideas that they were still doing and believing the right stuff. And they were confident of their position in God. But they happened to live in a prosperous city. And so they didn't have some of the challenges that some of the other churches had. They had fairly comfortable lives for the, for the day in which they lived. But yet in that comfort, in that, that helped to minister to them a false confidence where they were just rocking along in their lives, doing the stuff. And you remember what the Lord said, you think you're, you think you're so great, you think you're, you, you can see, and you're, you, you know, you're, what, you're blind, you're naked, you, you don't understand, you don't have what you think you have. And he comes down to the end and says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Here's Jesus outside of a church that professes to know him, knocking on the door saying, Let me in. And what he wanted was a relationship, wasn't it? He says, you let me in, I'll eat with you. We'll eat together. We'll sup together. We'll, we'll spend time with, it, with one another. You begin to get a sense of what the Lord is looking for from his people. You know, how many of you have ever tried to reconcile the idea that we need to have a fear of the Lord and yet a love relationship with him? The truth of the matter is, if we get that out of balance, things are not right. If we have a concept of this love relationship with God, it isn't far, it isn't hard for the devil to begin to twist that into a life where we become very careless about how we live. On the other hand, if people just go way overboard on i got to fear God. i got to fear God. And it becomes a, I'm afraid of him. I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do, not because I really want to or love him, but because I'm, I'm scared of the consequences. But oh, what a balance it is when you get them both in the, in the picture. Where there is a deep, holy respect for God. And what that means is simply this, that we get it. That God means what he says. This loving, awesome God is going to come and destroy this world by fire. There are terrible judgments that are coming upon this world. We saw it mirrored and pictured, not just pictured, it really happened, in the days of Noah. 
When the, when the thoughts and the intents of men's heart became so evil that the only response that God could give was to destroy every man, woman, boy, and girl, and all the air-breathing animals in the world. I mean, God's serious about sin. And if we live with a sense of carelessness as though, oh well, my God, we need to see with open eyes what's going on in this world and realize that it has a power to affect us if we let it. And to begin to be careless in our own minds and careless in our own actions. Why do you think Paul said it's, you know, it's time to wake up? Don't live according to the lusts of your natural desires and all these things that are wrong. It's not just lusts of the flesh. It was things like getting along with each other. See, all the manifestations of human nature if we do not believe in our hearts that God takes sin and the wickedness of this world seriously, then we don't take it seriously. At the same time, thank God that what he longs for is a relationship of love, isn't it? There's not a single person on the planet that God wants to come in among his people out of a sense of duty, out of a sense of just have it. Oh, God longs to, to have that kind of relationship where we understand that he loves us. We see, don't we see that balance uh, mirrored and, and expressed in Jesus? He had an unbroken fellowship with the Father. He never once compromised with sin, even in dealing with sinners. Where there was a compassion and a desire to reach and to save, there was never once a compromise with the sin itself. He didn't say to the woman, just go on, do the best you can. I've got it covered. He said, go and sin no more. Oh my. You know, one of the things we see when this kind of a spirit begins to, begins to take hold, we see more and more a drift in people's lives. You know, Jesus talked about the natural needs of our lives, didn't he? He said our, our Heavenly Father takes care of the sparrows, takes care of the birds of the air. He's concerned about their needs. If he cares about them, won't he care about you? But he says, seek first his kingdom and righteousness and all these things will be added to you. How many times, I mean, what, is the, what are the priorities of our lives? What is really most important? This is one of those quiet moments, isn't it? I don't believe the Lord is doing this to condemn, but I, I sure believe it's a serious, sober warning from his heart to ours of the danger of living in this hour that we live in. It's bad enough in Paul's day. But here we are living in the end of the age when darkness is being allowed to consume the minds of more and more people. And here we are called to be a light in such a world. Do you think you can just kind of have, a, have this private little Jesus off somewhere and you don't really need the people of God? You don't need to, I mean, you know, God's got it covered. I'm tired. I'm this, I'm that. Oh, my. What God is looking for is a people who understand the times, as Paul said. We understand the real situation. We're looking soberly at what's really going on. We're not fooling ourselves and kidding ourselves. We're not sucked in by the world around us and, how, and their values. We, see, we are able to see through it because we're in the Word. We're in fellowship with Him. We're wanting our, our minds to be more and more attuned to what He thinks and what He wants and how He sees it. I'll tell you, the more you hang around the world and listen to them and drink in what they say, the easier it is just to kind of drift and go to sleep. And when folks find it easy to come up with excuses why they don't want to come, it's just a, it's a condition of the heart. If it's truly, you don't understand what I'm saying. 
Good Lord, if you're in the hospital and your leg's up in the air in a sling, we don't expect you. And this is not just about trying to harangue people to come to church, but you see what's going on. There's a symptom. When so many people find a reason, find it easy to find a reason not to come with the people of God. What we need to be doing is not saying, not just saying, oh, I've got to be there, it's a duty. We've got to say, what's going, why do I feel that way? What's going on in here that causes me not to love to go to be with the people of God? I mean, look at the words of David. How many times? I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. In his presence is fullness of joy. My heart longs like the deer pants. My heart longs for you. Oh, when can I go and be with you, Lord? See, if that's not there, something is missing. Something is missing in our relationship with God. God wants, what God is looking for is a people with whom he can share. They come together, but every one of them has a relationship with God. Every one of them is walking with him. And when you get people like that together, they can worship the Lord. They can, and, we, and I thank God for the degree to which we have this. But this is a word that's needed. This is a word that is needed by God's people to warn about the spirit of the age and how easy it is to become pushed aside, slipped aside. You know how often we've heard used the illustration of the, the lion that's hunting gazelles or whatever it is they're hunting. But let's just think about an, about an animal that runs in herds. You know, what does the lion do? Does he charge in the middle and just say, hey, I got one? No, he is going to do his best to steer one away. Get them off by themselves where they don't have any defense. I'll tell you, we need to realize how much we need the Lord and the Lord in one another. And we need to come together not out of duty, not out of habit. God doesn't want that. He wants people who want a fellowship with His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. To focus on one another and to, and, and to be an encouragement one to another and to lift one another up and bear one another's burdens and all the glorious virtues that come from a relationship with Him, with Him dwelling in the midst of His people. Praise God. I'm sure there's a lot more can be said. But I just pray that God will help us in this area to examine our hearts and really look at where we're at. I mean, you might be one that's just caught up in the world. You don't, you don't get this at all. This is just nonsense. Or you're, you're a kid and you're coming because your parents make you at this point. Oh, God, I pray that he'll wake you up. I pray that he will help you to realize I don't care what the world says, this is real. And God can help you to see that it's real. There is a time to sound the trumpet in, in, in Zion, to sound an alarm in God's holy mountain. Because these things are coming. They're going to come at the right time. I thank God that he's holding off. If it means that there's others that are going to come and be part of his kingdom, Thank God. But there will come a time when the words of Revelation 22 will be fulfilled. Him that is holy, let him be holy still. Him that is filthy, let him be filthy still. See, there's going to come a point when there will be no crossing from one kingdom to another. Right now is a day of Mercy, but I'll tell you, it's a day when we need to be awake. We need to be having a relationship with God. If your heart is drifting, and you know it, if it is, God's word to you is to wake up and to say, Lord, help me. Help me to develop that personal relationship where I come and I do the things that pertain to my spiritual life because I love you. I do it because you put in a, a love and a desire on the inside. I, I want that. I want to be a vital part of the body of Christ. I don't want to come and say, well, that was a dull service. They didn't entertain me. 
I'll tell you, God's going to let it be that way sometime if that's the condition in here. God doesn't always let the fire fly. People in the wilderness had times when they just got so tired of the routine that they started grumbling. See, God allowed the conditions to bring out what was in here. If we have what we need in here, we're going to have a spirit that's going to persevere regardless of conditions, whether we're on the mountain, in the valley, or somewhere in between, whether, it's, whether life seems samey, or whether our, our attention is constantly being pulled out here. God, is, God can give us a sense of understanding the time, being alert, being self-controlled, not allowing ourselves to be sucked into the spirit of the world. And what did, what was the, the word that we've heard so many times in Hebrews? Again, I pray that this isn't, that somebody won't say, hey, people have been laying out, crowds are off, he's just trying to, there's so much more than that. When you begin to see that, there's, it's a symptom of something. We need to pray one for another that God will awaken the hearts of those that are really His and bring them into a vital relationship with Him. Verse, uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, 23. <laughs> Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. Why? <laughs> for he who promised is faithful. Praise God. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. So there's, it's a relationship kind of thing, isn't it? It's awful easy to think, well, I'm still serving the Lord. I still believe in Him. I don't, you know, I, I don't feel like going today. When we could. I'll tell you, if I, if I went by my feelings, there's a lot of times I wouldn't be here. You know, we have to get to the point where we say, Lord, give, I'm going to do what you want me to do, but I'm trusting in you. I know you can make a way. I know you can give me strength. Because that's important. I, I know that I don't have any of this in myself. I am looking to you, Lord, to do what's needed in me. And then he says this, let us not give up meeting together. As some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. So it isn't just about coming to services and that sort of thing. I believe the Lord's burden this morning is to get to the root of the issues. And that's a heart. Do we really have the fear of God in our hearts to where we take seriously how He looks at this world, what He sees? And, and the kind of a life that he longs for, that he has provided for us to live. It isn't just, I'm demanding that you live this way, even though I know you really can't. This is, I have given you my son to live in your heart. To impart to you a grace that enables you to be my people. I get it that you're not going to jump from all of a sudden to perfection, but you can be on the road, you can walk with me, and I will teach you. You can, you can enjoy the rest that I promised. You can have a love relationship with me day by day. There's a fear of God that, that needs to be real in the hearts of his people. Well, you look around and you, you realize everything you see is going to be destroyed. You want to live for this world, what you can have here? That's the wisdom of a fool. God has so much more. But along with that fear, we realize, do I serve him because I love him? You know, that was a song that, that our ensemble used to sing from time to time. I will serve thee because I love thee. You have given life to me. Praise God. I deal with a piano. I don't remember all the words sometimes. <laughs> but you have given life to me. I will serve you because I love you. Thank God that we have that privilege. It isn't like we, we have to bow down to a bully and do stuff we really don't want to do just to avoid punishment. Oh, that isn't what he wants. And if you're coming because you just feel a habit, you feel like you've got to, you're supposed to, you're supposed to put... I pray that God will help you to do one or the other. Either go to the world where you really want to live 
or to get the reality in your heart so you're here because you love him, because you want to fellowship with his people. Because you know you need him. You need that relationship that he's, he's created. We're not enough in ourselves. We need him. We need each other. And the Lord has provided everything we need. If we will stand, if we will trust him, if we will believe his word and his promises, he will be with his own to the end of the age. But Jesus' words are sobering words. He that endures to the end will be saved. Thank God it isn't based on my strength. He's provided. I can do that. But I can't do it if, I'm gonna, if my heart's going to be divided and pulled in this way and that way and just getting careless. Do you have that perfect balance in your heart of the fear of God and the love of God? I tell you, that'll hold us in the road, won't it? That'll carry us through. I just pray that God will help us to examine our hearts. I know this is kind of a scattered lot of thoughts this morning, but I pray that God is the only one that can take a word like this and... and cause it to make a difference in somebody's life. That's what I pray for. But I know he's faithful, don't you? Praise God.